It's time for Thriller Thursdays here on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Once again, Decoder Ring Theater presents another page from the casebook of that master of mystery, that sultan of sleuthing, Martin Bracknell's immortal detective, Black Jack Justice, starring Christopher Mott as Jack and Andrea Lyons as Trixie Dixon, girl detective. The name's Dixon. Trixie Dixon, girl detective. The detective business is a funny one, my friends. Most of the time, you take what comes. And most of the time, what comes is nothing at all. The clock ticks and the sun crosses from one side of your palatial offices to the next, and the door resolutely fails to open. It's like a great, big, flat plane of boring occasionally punctuated by someone shooting at you. And when you couple that with the opportunity to have as your only companion on this journey into nothingness a haircut that walks like a man... Someone whose company you neither enjoy on a conversational nor a recreational level. Someone who rates as a cautionary example at best. Well then, that secretarial school that your mother was always leaving pamphlets lying around in support of starts to look real good. But I suppose that ship has sailed now, hasn't it? Alas. It has been just such a week at the mighty firm of Justice and Dixon, and thus far Thursday looked like being no exception. Around 11 o'clock, old Squarejaw picked up the telephone receiver and held it briefly to his ear before returning it to its cradle with a glare in my direction that dared me to mock him for checking to see if the line was still working. Three hours later, I almost stood up to check and make sure that we hadn't somehow left the office door locked accidentally all week, when it spared me the trouble by opening to admit a gentleman caller. He wasn't much to look at, and after four days of nothing but Jack's face, that was really saying something. He was tall, but not imposing. Slick, but not exactly smooth. Lean, but not necessarily fit. All in all, he was going to need a heck of an opening line if he was even going to have a shot. And I was so bored that was really saying something. Which one of you is Justice? And that was not it. That is just sad for you. What's that? I said, he's Justice, I'm Dixon, and why don't you help yourself to a chair? (laughs) I'm pretty sure I just did. Only pretty sure? She's got a mouth on her. And all sorts of other things that you can only guess at. I don't know. I can guess real good. Well, a lifetime of practicing, I suppose. All right, cool your jets. I promise you, my jets are not even slightly warm. Then don't run off our new client, Mr... You don't know me? I didn't say that I did, and I didn't say that I didn't. If you knew me, you wouldn't think I was a client. We've had stranger... I bet you have. One of you princesses care to deal me in? My boredom is actually increasing, and I didn't know it could do that. Trixie, this is Daniel Goodman of the Southside Goodmans. Real cute. They also call him Torpedo Dan. Yes, they do. Torpedo Dan? Used to be a shooter for their Corsetti mob? Who says used to? I hear Mr. Corsetti's got a new number one. Some Spanish kid. Panamanian. Whatever. It's all Latin and delightful. So if the Panamanian is the hot gun, what does that make Torpedo Dan? Mostly administration? I'm here with a message. Ah, errand boy. Once again, not a happy ending. You better rein her in. The message. What? I'm not going to waste precious banter on you, Goodman. Your threats don't mean anything because Corsetti didn't send you here to make them. He sent you here with a message. I am curious to know what that message might be. Mr. Corsetti says to tell you two nosy peepers... To stay away from his family. What? You heard me. Well, that should be a very easy instruction to obey, as we have never had anything to do with any member of his family. Funny man. I'm unclear on this. Do we mean family family, or is this like mafia crime family family? Does it matter? No, it doesn't. Mm. Well, it kind of does to me, because I would like to know what the dangerous crime lord would like me not to do in order that I might choose not to do it. I've had about enough of you. Said no one ever. Look, Twinkletoes, I'm actually attempting to be compliant. Some fellas like that. Okay, hold on. You two are on a job. Mr. Corsetti says you're off it. We are not on a job. All right. Be like that. Be like what? Mr. Goodman, I grant you that the girl detective tends to get under one's skin. 
if you would kindly keep your seat. What for? In order for me to impress upon you the depth and breadth of the mistake that you have made. Your justice? She's Dixon. Yes. Then there's no mistake. Corsetti wants you off the job. We are not on a job. We have not been on a job in a week and a half. And that was a lost cat. You can have it your way. I am not having it any way in particular. We are not working for any member of the Corsetti family. Yeah, I'm still not clear on what that means. It does not matter, as we are not, in fact, working for anybody. Well, there is that, yeah. This is why you discovered us both here, dozing lightly in the middle of the day. We are not on the job. On any job. We are not currently employed by anyone to do anything. All right. I'll tell Corsetti, but he isn't going to like it. Oh, hell. This was less than good. After years of pushing and shoving amongst the gangs, the Corsetti mob had settled in as the city's number one operation. We weren't above irritating high rollers, and history suggested that we didn't even mind doing it for reasons that weren't particularly noble, clever, or even logical. Sometimes we did it because it seemed like the thing to do. Sometimes we did it without really meaning to while we were trying to do something else. And sometimes we just did it for kicks. But there was one essential fact that tied all of these instances together. We almost always acted on the say-so of a client. Don't get me wrong, gangsters are bad people, but I am not a public servant and in no way qualified to hand out just desserts. All right, that's a lie, but those qualifications in no way obligate me to risk life and limb, especially when there are much more interesting ways to use both. In short, if we had set out to annoy Alfonso Corsetti, we would have done so, and with gusto, and accepted the consequences and dealt with them in a fashion that you might have called manly had I not been so very, very much the opposite. But this? Well, this was just stupid. See, as far as I could tell, there wasn't any way to convince Corsetti or his underlings that we were not, in fact, working on a case that involved him or any member of his extended family in any way. And while there was a certain practicality to shutting the office and hiding under a bed for a week, I wasn't convinced that that was going to do the job either. As far as I could see, the best shot we had at weathering this storm was the one thing that had been our anchor through similar, if less random, misadventures in the past. Deserving whatever we got. The role of innocent bystander was not one for which I was well suited. If Corsetti had taken it into his head to be annoyed with us, then we should find out how we were supposedly doing that, and then do more of it. Because that would give us a general idea of where the bullets were going to come from, and so far, that has always been enough. There was only one logical place to start. Does anybody mind if I ask what I did to deserve this? I could answer that question, but you wouldn't like it very much. I struggled to recall just now the last time I liked something very much. Ah, oh, pathos. Where's the file? This is how you talk to me? You storm into my office like you're going to the mattresses right here in the squad room, and you start barking orders like the chief of detectives? Have we never met, or is there some other reason why you think this approach is going to work for you? Lieutenant, you're absolutely right. Yes, I am. I was very rude. Yes, you were. And I really do apologize. Well, all right, then. Now, where's the damn file? I am holding it in my hands. That is not a file. What that actually is, is more of a cardboard box. Nothing gets past you. In this particular instance, it is both a cardboard box, which it is, and a corsetti file. <sighs> or at least the first box. The first of... Seven. Oh, for Pete's sake. Sabian, if you know this much about the city's most dangerous gangster, how come you still don't know enough to put him in jail? Put him in jail? Put him in jail?! Dixon, you're a genius! Why didn't I ever think of that? All right, don't get hysterical. We haven't put him in jail because Al Corsetti is a very slippery fish, is why. Because we can fill seven boxes with what we think we know, but we don't have a thimble full of what a judge would call actual proof. And that is because people who might be willing and able to supply some of said proof have a long-standing habit of getting dead. Sabian, don't you have a... Like a fact sheet or a precy of some kind? A precy, Mr. Frenchman? A precy is... A... I know what a precy is! So what you would like to appear from one of these boxes is a neatly typed, double-spaced, single sheet that just happens to tell you exactly what you're looking for without you exactly knowing what it is until you see it. Yeah, kind of. You got anything like that? No! The folder with the green tab is biographical. This? This is Moby Dick. It's 38 pages. It ain't even a book report on Moby Dick. Is it possible that you became a private detective for no other reason than being bone idle? My shocking origin story revealed at last. My problem with all of this is that we still don't know what Smile and Dan meant. 
I can help you with that a little bit. What are these? Crime scene photos. Do I want to open this? Probably not. <gasps> Holy cat! And she opens them anyway. These are the last people that Corsetti wanted to keep away from his extended crime family. They didn't get a nice warning message. They never even knew that they were suspected of crossing the big man's business interests. He just made them go away. So it's family, family, not the other kind of family. Be my guess. Why would he take that less seriously than the other? He doesn't. He killed a room full of people over business. And that's not a serious thing to Corsetti. That's business. That's following his instincts, trying to be something like a human being. That's hard. So Corsetti cares what somebody involved here thinks of him. Somebody he doesn't want to look like a bad guy to, even if they know better. Yeah. So it's his kids. Says here Corsetti has six daughters and one son, who would now be about eight years old. My guess is that if he thought we were a threat to the son, we'd already be dead. Probably true. Kid is the crown prince, born and bred to be just like his old man, but he's a problem for the next guy. Maybe the one after that. I'm not sure you're going to live all that long. Why would you say that? I've eaten with you. It's probably true, but you still shouldn't say it. The youngest daughters are still too young. This one's pretty, but at 17, I think he'd still have killed her. Just for looking at her picture. Yeah. The 19-year-old is away at school, unless that's out of date. Well, that's still right. So the oldest girl, Adriana, a little older than her siblings, still not married. That's not a small deal in a big Italian family. Not just Italian. Mama Dixon goes on about it, too. Yes, but she hasn't threatened my life in some years. Kind of a plain Jane. But maybe she's Daddy's little girl. So why didn't he just shoot us? If he thought you were following the girl, he'd have done it. But if he thought you were working for her... Papa, you killed my detectives and embarrassed me. You laugh. But there's a... Look. Your daughter can give you, and nobody else can. Guy would go an awful long way out of his way not to get that look. Even a guy like Corsetti. Is that our ace in the hole? So far, it's our only card of any kind. But it's going to have to do. Thanks for the use of the hall, Sabian. Yeah, don't mention it. To anybody! And thus fortified with a whole lot of not much, we made our way back to our mighty world headquarters. We were a little wiser, or at least we had a working theory, but as we trudged past the faded out-of-order sign on the elevator and up the stairs, a degree of dread had begun to set back in. Well, what do you think? About what? Please tell me you aren't actually that vapid. I'm not sure that word means what you think it means. I think it means that you're an idiot. I think it means that the boss of bosses thinks that we're on a fishing expedition for his possibly alienated little girl, and that if he even gets a whiff that this non-existent job might include the gathering of evidence by us against him, he will not hesitate to smear us all over the walls. That's what I think. Okay, yeah, it doesn't mean that. Jack, I don't care about the stupid word. Me neither. Did you leave the light on in the office? Don't be stupid. It's the middle of the day. Is that a yes? No, it's a don't be stupid. I always turn the light off. And I don't pay that much attention to what you do. I turned the stupid light off. Well, it's on now. It is, isn't it? Door doesn't look like it's been forced. Hard to tell from here. Why are we still walking? You think we should bolt? Yes. No. Yes. Wouldn't matter. There's someone on the stairs behind us. One, maybe two. They sound big. Then I guess we're opening the office. Guns blazing? No, but keep it handy. Ready? Ready. Good afternoon. I am Alfonso Corsetti, and I have a problem. You are listening to Blackjack Justice from DecoderRingTheater.com. The detective business is the detective business. You take what comes. You don't try to outthink it or wonder what it portends. You just play the hand that you're dealt and try not to consider the fact that, in the end, the house always wins. But still, as I considered Al Corsetti sitting quietly in our client chair, a question kept playing over and over in my head. Why aren't we dead yet? I was in no particular hurry for the other shoe to drop, you understand, but everything felt like it was happening to someone else. 
The gorillas from the stairs caught up, but Corsetti dismissed them with a wave of his hand, along with the two slick-looking operators who had waited in the office with him. They all left without a protest, and I could hear them retreating to a respectful distance down the hall, as if they were powerless to do anything else. And they were. Corsetti seemed huge. There was an aura around him, something he projected that was imperial and godlike, and his lackeys were clearly deeply in his thrall. I was feeling a little enthralled myself, which is strange because part of me still expected the big man to strangle us with his bare hands like an infant Hercules. But as the closing rattle of the grey-green glass and the door faded, so too did Alfonso the Magnificent. And in the space that he had occupied, there sat a sad, worried man, just like all of the other sad, worried men that had paraded through the office over the years. It was a heck of a trick, and I don't know how he pulled it off, but it left me in a rare state of speechlessness. Jack either elected to pretend he hadn't noticed out of courtesy or actually did not notice out of stupidity and thoughtlessness, which now that I think of it seems like the more likely option. Mr. Corsetti, I don't know what Torpedo Dan told you. Torpedo Dan? I haven't heard that in a long time. Did you call him that? Possibly. Uh, Amongst other things. Uh, He'd have liked being called that. He's a good man and been with me a long time. He's mostly uh, administration these days, but I know he misses the work. Shooters shoot. For most of them, it's the only thing they've ever been good at. And there's no blur in the line between success and failure. It's hard to find a second calling. And you, Mr. Justice? Who were you a shooter for? Uncle Sam. Maybe you think you can shoot me. I am unarmed. No, sir. You're never unarmed. The men in the hall? And all the others just like him? It is true. Everywhere I go... I am Alfonso Corsetti. Sir, I don't know what Torpedo Dan told you, but we are not on a case that involves you or your family, or anyone at all, actually. I know. Danny told me. He... He felt that you were being sincere. I trust his judgment. Well, all's well that ends well. Who's for a drink, then? She speaks. She does. She She almost never stops. She is very beautiful. Is she yours? No, I'm mine. Don't make me sorry that I offered you a drink. Last chance. Not for me, thank you. All good here. All right, then. I hate to drink alone, but I'm not fanatical about it or anything. After Danny left your office, you and your partner went to one police plaza. Just like swallows to Capistrano. And you visited Police Lieutenant Sabian. You have a man in Sabian's squad room? Miss Dixon, there are not many things that I have just one of. You'll forgive me if I don't turn that into an off-color remark. I'm... Still feeling a bit jittery. What did you learn from the dear lieutenant? Not much. I am certain that is not what I asked. If I am to be honest with you, I must feel that you are just as honest with me. And before Jack can turn that into a quip that will spoil this nice collegial atmosphere we're working on... Thank you. We walked out the door with the educated guess that there was only one person that this concern of yours could surround. Your eldest daughter. Adriana, yes. Police Lieutenant Sabian has nice instincts. He had a little help. You do not need to protect him, or yourselves. You are right, of course. We weren't working for Adriana. I know that now. Besides, now, you are working for me. I beg your pardon? Your services are for hire, yes? For a very narrow range of services, yes. Or no? No is not something that I am accustomed to hearing. It might be the answer anyway. But if you tell us what brings you to us, we'll know better. You won't break the law. Not without a good reason. Getting paid is not a good reason? Not in and of itself, no. What about self-preservation? If that's a threat, Mr. Corsetti... It is not. It is curiosity. In my experience, there is nothing that cannot be arranged with some combination of a glad hand and a fist. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. I recognize that. Shakespeare. People who quote things think they are so very clever, but you are simply parroting back the words of the long dead. Yes, sir. You have annoyed me more than once, you know, Jack Justice. Yes, sir. There have been moments when I might have dealt with you. Mm, But I wasn't worth it. What makes you so certain? I'm still here. Let's pull the conversation back from the theoretical, shall we? You thought your eldest daughter had come to us for help. Why? Adriana and I, we had a quarrel. She was upset. She left the house, and I had her... That is to say... You had her followed. 
Of course I did. Where did she go? Where did she go? She came here. She didn't. She came to this building. There are other offices in this building. Perhaps she came to see the bankruptcy lawyer or the travel agent. Why not the travel agent? She was coming to see you. But she didn't. No, she didn't. She most likely could not face it. She probably stood in your stairwell and cried for an hour and then came home. What could she have had to say that was so bad? Perhaps it was, I am Alfonso Corsetti's daughter. Mr. Corsetti. No, don't. Sorry, forgive him. He's actually kind of a softy, but I recognize that. Recognize what? That thing you just did. It's called parental drama, and it's very big around the Dixon household. What did you do? When? You and your daughter quarreled. Yes. And it was something that you did. Who says that it was? I do. You are Alfonso Corsetti. What did you do? Perhaps... Perhaps I will take that drink now. Coming up. You are not married, Miss Dixon? I am not. May I ask why not? I have always found that why is a more interesting question than why not. You could clearly have any man that you wished. Oh, and I do. But I don't keep them long. And why not? There's that question again. Though the answer is that, frankly, I don't find them that interesting. Even if the book is very good, reading it again and again to the exclusion of the rest of the library? Sounds a little nutty to me. Here's your drink. Thank you. Perhaps the comparison is not such a good one. My Adriana, she would like to be married, but it has always been difficult. Oh, yes? Uh, meeting the right sort of man. Which sort is the right sort? Uh, you know how men are. I do. Uh, the men who work for me, they have great respect for me, but I see them, how they treat their women, and... I know that they are not right for my little girl, but they, still, they try to win her attention. Her attention or yours? What's that? Are her suitors courting her or courting her father? A girl can tell the difference, you know. I have never of tried Of course to... you haven't. But everywhere you go, you are Alfonso Corsetti. Yes. Has she ever considered dating... How shall I put this delicately? Outside the extended mafia crime family? Oh, that was very delicate. Thank you. There uh, was a boy... When she was 17, he broke her heart. Ah, I see where this is going. She was so upset. I did what any loving father would do. Oh, Alfonso, you didn't kill her prom date, did you? No, not exactly. I simply had some of my men remind him of what it means to cross a corsetti. Just to be clear, sir, that might be what any loving father would want to do, but they don't actually do it. In part because most of them don't have hired goons. And Adriana was less than pleased. I could not understand it. Always I was... Her eyes would dance when she looked at me. And since that day, it has never been the same. Teenage girls are supposed to have broken hearts, Mr. Cassetti. They're supposed to have wildly dramatic shifts between happiness and misery. And they're supposed to break up with the same boy six times. And they're supposed to make the same mistakes over and over. It's... it's how they learn what not to do later. Well, I thank you for this. And I have taken care not to make the same mistake with her sisters. But Adriana is not a little girl anymore. It is time that she was married. And she agrees. Yes. But I have found suitable young men for her and she refuses them. We don't like suitable young men. The men our fathers think are suitable want to marry them, not us. What does your father do again? He's an accountant. Don't get me started. They're like a secret society. Adriana found a fellow that she thinks is suitable all by herself, didn't she? Yes. And you don't trust him? I trust no one. I cannot. What if he wanted to use my daughter against me? Sir, unless she is more involved than I suspect she is, your daughter may know things, but she likely can't prove them. Sabian has seven boxes full of things that he knows about you, but here you sit. Seven? <laughs> How nice. But still... How can I trust this man with my greatest treasure, my little girl? You wanted to sick the dogs on him. I wanted to make certain of him, to know her heart would not be broken again, to impress upon him... What it means to cross a corsetti? Yes. And Adriana remembered her old beau, and there were some tears, yes? She looked at me with such... like I were the devil himself, and I may well be, but never to her... And she said she would take care of it herself and came this close to hiring detectives to vet her own sweetheart to your satisfaction without putting the hurt on him. Yes. And now you are going to do it for me. No. It is what she wants. No. It is what you want, except it isn't really. What you want is for your daughter to look at you like she used to. Like you were the biggest, most wonderful thing in the entire world. 
What you're asking us to do won't do that. It might. What does her young man do? He is a carpenter. Any chance he's really after a foot in the door of the family business? No. He is... No, he wants nothing from me. He makes cabinets. He is content. Swell. You're going to go home and tell Adriana that you were wrong. That I was what? Yeah, she'll be surprised too. Tell her that she's a grown woman and that you trust her judgment. Tell her that if she wants to marry this carpenter, you will be happy for her and not interfere unless she asks you to, and that everything will be just exactly as she wants it, and that she will always be your little girl. I guarantee you, Niagara Falls. You just smile and keep your hands in your pockets and watch the grandchildren roll in. I do nothing. Sometimes that's the right thing to do. And if she doesn't burst into tears of joy and tell you that you are the most wonderful daddy in the world, your money will be cheerfully refunded. What money? Oh, we get thirty-nine ninety-five a day. Plus expenses. Of which there weren't really any. But you didn't do anything. Yes, sir. But sometimes that's the right thing to do. He thought about it for a minute, but then the most dangerous man in town pulled a fifty from a fat roll of bills and laid it on his desk. We had gone from shortly to be dead to refusing employment to paid anyway. But that was a detective business for you, my friends. You have to take what comes. Blackjack Justice, episode sixty-two, Strange Bedfellows, was written and directed by Greg Taylor and starred Christopher Mott and Andrea Lyons, with additional voices supplied by Ryan Cero, Scott Moyle, and Greg Taylor. This recording and the story, characters, and situations depicted within are the property of their author and creator, and protected by copyright. Until next time, remember, DecoderRingTheater dot com is your address to adventure. There are many things that we can all do that may help stop the spread of the coronavirus. But one thing we can all do is to have a plan in case you do get sick. First, consult with your health care provider for more information about monitoring your health for symptoms suggestive of COVID-19. Second, stay in touch with others by phone or email. You may need to ask for help from friends, family, neighbors, community health workers, or more if you become sick. And finally, determine who can care for you if your caregiver gets sick. For more information, go to cdc.gov and be well, everyone.